Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Just two minutes, sir. Two more minutes, sir. Yeah, sure. We're ready, sir.
Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start the session. I invite Dr. S. Muruganandam, Assistant Professor, to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon to all. It's a great privilege and honor bestowed upon me to introduce today's resource person, Dr. Muthusami Lakshman, Professor of Eminence and Sir National Science Chair, Department of Nonlinear Dynamics. School of Physics, Bharadas University, Trichirapalli. He completed his B.Sc. and M.Sc. course at NGM College, Kolachi, and Madras Christian College, Chennai. His Ph.D. in University of Madras under the supervision of Professor P.M. Matthews. He has about 42 years of teaching experience, 50 years of research ex experience, and has guided over 33 students for their Ph.D. degrees. He has written more than 400 research articles in internationally, 58 proceedings articles, and published 10 books reported publishers. He is uh, currently supervising four PhD and several postdoctoral fellowship. He has received some of the <coughs> highest awards in India, including SS Bhatnagar Prizes in Physical Science in 1989. On the 2021 Independence Day, the government of Tamil Nadu has bestowed upon him the coveted Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Award for scientific contributions. He also awarded DAE Rajana Ramana Fellowship. He was also member of editorial board of several theoretical physics journals. He has uh, held visiting position in many prestigious institutions all around the world. Thanking you. So hand over the session to <laughs> Professor Sir. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will start sharing my screen, I think. Uh, start sharing. Yeah, so let me. Um, so you. Full screen mode. Yeah. So is my screen uh, uh, slide uh, available? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Yeah. Okay, then. So in this uh, second lecture, uh, I will talk about the notion of integrability and solitons. It is not integrability of solitons as uh, given in the program. It's integrability given in the and solitons. You are all familiar with waves and waves. Infinite number of uh, waves propagating, sine, cosine waves and so on. But here I talk, I am concerned about solitary wave. Isolated single wave in the 
entire space from minus infinity to plus infinity if it is a one dimensional space for example solitary waves and these solitary waves under collision they retain their form and speed shape and speed etc so they undergo billiard like elastic collision solitary waves become solitons so i am talking about dynamical systems so yesterday i started with some of the simplest dynamical systems linear dynamical systems linear harmonic oscillator which everyone start studying from their school days onwards but then i have also introduced the notion of linear dynamical systems and then i talked about linear superposition principle and if any system fails to satisfy this linear superposition principle then it becomes a nonlinear dynamical systems and once you consider even the simplest of nonlinear dynamical systems it can show very many surprising features phenomena bifurcations and chaos so i illustrated that with a simple example of of a cubic and harmonic harmonic oscillator acted upon by additional damping and external forcing which one may call as duffing oscillator duffing was a dutch physicist who was interested in studying the dynamics of uh, Mm, electrode uh, and triode valves and so on so i brought out the i try to bring out the phenomena of chaos sensitive dependence on initial conditions and i pointed out even that simplest system a second order differential represented by second order ordinary differential equation the dynamics is represented by such a simple single differential equation but non linear it showed all kinds of complex phenomena and i pointed out that it cannot be integrated you cannot obtain exact solutions so you can only go to numerical solutions but this numerical solution analysis if you do a careful analysis it shows very many kinds of bifurcations including period doubling bifurcations and then leading to and a finite parameter range showing chaotic behavior sensitive dependence on initial conditions so even simplest nonlinear system shows certain intrinsic unpredictability even without going to without going into quantum properties okay even a simple nonlinear dynamical system can show certain intrinsic nonlinearity intrinsic uncertainty as a consequence of which the system becomes non integrable not integrable and it exhibits very many interesting behaviors and when you couple many of these systems they can show different kinds of collective dynamical behaviors synchronizations uh, and synchronization of chaotic behavior and so on and so forth but um, i have very quickly gone through some of uh, such notions but in this talk i want to point out that there exists a class of dynamical systems non linear it they show very regular very ordered properties in the case of duffing oscillator and similar oscillators i pointed out matthews lakshman and oscillator under forcing damping or linard type oscillator and so on they exhibit for certain parametric range parametric range regular periodic behavior and then complex behavior chaotic but in whatever region complex behavior chaotic complex behavior in it you can find a class of interesting in important dynamical systems 
given that they have nonlinear proofs, they can be integrated in terms of functions. And as a consequence, you can identify many interesting properties. Once you have exact solutions in terms of known functions, you can do very many things. You can understand the nature in different ways. And you can build upon, if you have further complicated force, you can build upon this known integrable dynamical systems, some kind of approximation methods based on these exact solutions. And you can learn a lot about the underlying dynamical systems. So in the morning, Professor Bhaskaran talked a lot about complex dynamical system, complexity, and so on. So in these uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, you find regularity and complexity depending on the nature of nonlinear forces that is acting on the system. So essentially, my aim in this present talk is to provide an overview of the notion of integrability in contrast to chaos, which I tried to point out yesterday. In first, in low dimensional systems, what I call as finite dimensional nonlinear dynamical systems. And I also very quickly introduce the notion of what is called lax pair, which can help in finding the exact solutions. And then extend these ideas to nonlinear wave equations, nonlinear dispersive partial differential equations. So we are all familiar with different kinds of waves, waves on strings and so on and so forth. So you are in your classical mechanics or in your uh, different uh, in electrodynamics and in many other areas you discuss, uh, <clears throat> for example, Maxwell's equation and so on. So under appropriate circumstances, they are all linear partial differential equations. But I will take up a typical nonlinear dispersive partial differential equations, and then bring out this notion of solitary waves and the soliton property. Okay. So that can explain very many natural phenomena, including, for example, tsunami, isolated wave, which can travel without change of form or diminution of speed over several thousand kilometers and so on. So that's my main motivation. So I will, with a brief introduction, I will introduce the notion of low dimensional nonlinear dynamical systems which exhibit integrability. What is integrability? And how do you define that? And some of these, um, these systems typically admit what is known as lax pairs in terms of lax operators, pair, pair of operators, which can lead to solutions. And then, I will go consider coupled such dynamical systems leading to the notion of Fermi pasta Ulam phenomena, which was identified in the beginning of 1950s, and which ultimately the explanation of this particular phenomena leads to the derivation of a nonlinear dispersive wave equation called Kotovec Debris equation, which surprisingly admits a lax pair. Compatibility of these lax pairs leads to the KDB equation, and so solitary waves and soliton solutions. And I will very briefly mention some of the other soliton equations before I conclude. So integrability is associated with very many concepts, which perhaps uh, at this uh, point of time, but many of you will uh, will appear um, uh, very new. They have underlying geometric, group theoretic, singularity structure, solution structure, uh, properties, etc. And in recent times, very many techniques and mathematical methods have been developed. I will not go into the details. I will quick, uh, skip them. But as far as low dimensional integrable dynamical systems are concerned, one can identify several interesting cases. And very often, they exhibit Lagrangian and Hamiltonian structures, 
But in recent times, we also find that these Lagrangian and Hamiltonians need not be of the standard form. The standard Lagrangian, as you are all familiar, the Lagrangian L is just the difference between the kinetic and potential energy. The Hamiltonian sum of kinetic plus potential energy. But many of these integrable nonlinear dynamical systems may have Lagrangian Hamiltonians where you cannot make such a distinction of um, kinetic and potential energy parts. One such example was an oscillator which I, as a student originally, when I was a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Matthews, which now it's famously called Matthews Lakshman oscillator, ML oscillator, which can be classically solved, semi-classically analyzed and quantum mechanically, you can solve exactly, and you can find the energy spectrum. And over the years that it has been generalized in different directions. So I will very briefly point out this interesting integrable uh, low dimensional dynamical system. Very recently, some of my students in my group, Chandrasekhar, Sindhilwell and um, uh, with me, have identified other interesting class of such integrable dynamical systems. They are called modified Emden equations or Chandrasekhar, Sindhilwell, Lakshman and oscillators. They can again be solved classically, semi-classically, quantum mechanically, and they lead to what is known as isochronous oscillators and their classification. Etc. So, very many interesting properties come about as far as low dimensional dynamical system is concerned. So, in order to appreciate, and that can be generalized in many different directions, which has been done in the recent past. So, very briefly, I will touch upon these topics before I go to the notion of nonlinear dispersive waves, linear dispersive waves, and nonlinear dispersive waves leading to solitary waves and solitons. So yesterday, I spent some time on the dynamics of linear harmonic oscillator, and I defined why it is a linear oscillator, why the underlying differential equation is a linear differential equation, and the consequent properties. So you consider, uh, based on the Newton's laws for um, the uh, simple uh, restoring force F equal to minus K, K is the force constant into displacement X, F equal to minus KX. So you can write down the dynamical equation as MX do double dot or MD square X by DT, DT square plus um, <clears throat> KX equal to zero or dividing throughout by M. You have the dynamical equation X double dot plus omega naught square X equal to zero where dot means d by dt, simplifying notation. And then I pointed out that this equation, uh, you consider the initial value problem, given the initial amplitude x of 0 equal to capital A, x dot equal to 0, the initial velocity is 0. Then you find the appropriate solutions for solving the Cauchy initial value problem in terms of harmonic functions, initial value problem with x of 0 equal to a, x dot of 0 equal to 0 leads to the solution x of t equal to a cos omega naught t, the periodic solution, where the period is independent of the initial value, the amplitude. Okay, period capital T equal to 2 pi by omega naught. Okay. So consider this dynamical system. And this dynamical system, you also know from your uh, uh, knowledge of classical mechanics, can be associated with the Lagrangian L could of x dot square. M I have taken for convenience to be one unity without loss of generality of x dot square minus of omega naught square x square. So omega naught is the natural frequency as I have been pointing out. So this of x dot square corresponds to kinetic energy. And half omega naught square x square corresponds to the potential energy as you are all familiar. And you can write down the corresponding Hamiltonian, which you can also obtain from the principle of least action. Uh, the Hamiltonian H 
is nothing but the canonical momentum p into x dot x dot is dx by dt minus l which turns out to be the kinetic energy uh, sorry this is half this is p square by 2 no x dot square here sorry this x dot square uh, wrongly typed so p square by 2 2m but m i am taking as a one p square by 2 plus half omega naught square x square so p square by 2 is the kinetic energy where p is nothing but dl by dx dot the canonically conjugate momentum is equal to dl by dx dot which is nothing but x dot because l is has this form normally you write this mx dot i am taking m as u one for convenience okay so kinetic energy is p square by two and potential energy is half omega naught square x square so the uh, total hamiltonian is this and from this hamiltonian you can also write down the canonical equations of motion x dot equal to dh by dp and p dot equal to minus dh by dx. So from which also you combining this, you can write the equation of motion as a system of two coupled first order differential equation, which when you combine, you get the second order differential equation. Another way of looking at this problem is that you can also associate with this equation of motion. This is a differential equation. You, in order to find the solution, you undo the differentiation by integrating it. So if you do, do one integration, you get one integral, integral of motion, I1 equal to half x dot square plus half omega naught square x square, which you can associate with the, of course, with the Hamiltonian. Okay. By taking P as x dot, so you get half P square by two plus half omega naught square x square. You can also find another a second integral by doing a second uh, another integration uh, and undoing this uh, differentiation. But this one will be time dependent, dependent on the independent variable t, wherein the first integral also appears. If you invert this quantity, then you will get x. So knowing the two integrals, you can immediately write down the solution. So you find that this harmonic oscillatory equation admits a proper number of integral, one time independent integral, and from which you are able to hear in this case, obtain a second integral, which is time dependent. So it is sufficient if you know for a second order differential equation dynamical system, you can identify one time independent integral, you may be able to find the exact solution and so on. So that is the way you look at a given dynamical system and to associate integrals of motion with exact solutions. And so, on. so once you know the integral of motion, then you can find the, write down the solution x equal to a cos omega t, and then you can uh, draw the time trajectory or the phase space trajectory and so on. So the dynamics can be exactly solved. Next, more interesting problem or a more general problem, the damped harmonic oscillator. X double dot plus alpha X dot plus lambda X equals zero. Now you have this damping force. Alpha is the parameter damping coefficient to dx by dt. So that corresponds to the friction force. Now this problem, of uh, damped harmonic oscillator, you know, the free harmonic oscillator, classically you have the dynamics and you can go to quantum mechanics by considering treating the, um, the variables X and P as operators and writing down the corresponding Schrodinger equation and uh, coming to the time independent form. And you can solve the, uh, the Schrodinger equation time independent Schrodinger equations in terms of Hermite polynomials and so on, and you can find the quantized energy levels and so on. So the quantum problem can be solved for the linear harmonic oscillator. But for the damped harmonic oscillator, you know that you have the corresponding damped solution. This is the damped part exponential minus alpha t and then a periodic part. Okay. Now quantizing such a damped oscillator is an extremely challenging problem that has been being considered over 
many, many uh, decades by different people and so on. There are different approaches. But very surprisingly, only very recently in my group, uh, Chandrasekhar Sindhilvan, myself in 2007, we had shown that this system through a new technique, new method, that a damped harmonic oscillator can also admit an integral of motion, time independent integral of motion, though complicated, you can write down its exact form and you can relate this to a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian. But those Lagrangian and Hamiltonians will not be just kinetic energy um, plus potential energy or kinetic energy minus potential energy, but they will have a more general form. Everything gets mixed up. But if you write the canonical equation or Lagrange equation, you will find that is exactly the equation, uh, the equation of motion. So, but you will have different forms for under damping, over damping, and critical damping. And you can use this structure to quantize this, and we have given certain formulation. But this has been taken up in recent times by, for example, a famous uh, physicist C.M. Bender and his co workers uh, to quantize similar systems and generalizing this uh, kind of damped harmonic oscillator. So even in linear uh, uh, dynamical system, there are very many interesting uh, uh, dynamical systems, both classically and quantum mechanically, you can identify. Now you go to damp uh, unharmonic oscillator, harmonic oscillator plus nonlinear force, nonlinear uh, un uh, cubic force. Well, again, you can associate a Lagrangian, the kinetic part of x dot square and the potential part of omega naught square x square plus lambda by 4 x square 4, and the corresponding Hamiltonian, which is equivalent to the first integral. You can multiply by an x dot throughout, which you can treat as an integrating factor, and then you can do one integration and you can get the first integral, which we can show to be nothing but the Hamiltonian. And why the Hamiltonian is associated with the energy. And why energy occurs? Because there is a time translation in between that certain symmetry is associated, and so on. And when you integrate, you undo this integration in this first integral, then you get new kinds of functions. You have to define new uh, transcendental uh, functions, namely the elliptic function, Jacobian elliptic function, and so on, which is associated with the modulus parameter. And when this modulus parameter goes to zero, elliptic functions becomes harmonic function, Cn becomes sine. And when it becomes one, k, k goes to one, it becomes hyperbolic function. And that's, that will play a very crucial role later on in identifying solitary wave solitons, which, uh, to which I will come later on. And then you can ask the question, do nonlinear systems, if they are integrable, if they admit uh, interesting uh, periodic uh, properties, uh, structures, etc., do nonlinear systems always admit elliptic functions or more general solutions or even more complicated solutions? Is amplitude dependence of frequency of oscillations a fundamental property of nonlinear oscillators? So one can ask, pose several such questions. If you do that, even at the fundamental level, at the single particle level, the dynamical equations can be generalized in different ways. So x double dot plus g of x equal to zero. So in this case, g of x is minus omega naught, uh, omega naught square x plus lambda x cube. You can have even more gentle form. You can have lambda x rho x power 5, and so on and so forth. But you can also consider forms like f of x into x dot square, the quadratic damping multiplied by an arbitrary function f of x. So these are all called Lenard equations. Or you can have just a, a, a linear power in the damping x double dot plus some arbitrary function h of x, x dot plus g of x equal to zero and more general forms. And then you can consider coupled versions of this above systems, n coupled linear type equations and so on. Okay, let's not worry about these complications. Let me consider only the simplest of these equations, linear type one and linear type two. 
and uh, if you do careful analysis you you find very often if these systems are integrable linear type 1 of this form they in general lead to hamiltonian functions but of a general form velocity dependent or position dependent mass hamiltonians so instead of h equal to p square plus potential the kinetic energy of p square plus potential energy b of x you get f of x into p square so the potential also depends on the momentum or velocity so these are called velocity dependent potentials velocity dependent hamiltonians so that is one uh, generalization one finds through a careful analysis of this linear type 1 equation very recently we find linear type 2 equations interesting dynamical systems can have the opposite property h can be half into f of p the momentum an arbitrary function of momentum into x square quadratic in the position variable plus a potential like uh, term which depends only on the momentum variable and their various generalizations so these kind of hamiltonian the corresponding lagrangian i call non standard lagrangian uh, hamiltonian systems and they arise because of the consequence of existence of very many symmetries discrete and continuous symmetries and so on but how did i come to this kind of uh, generalized dynamical non linear non linear dynamical system in fact if you consider this linear type o, one one type equation x double dot plus f of x x dot square plus g of x equal to 0 you multiply by an integrating factor x dot the e power 2 integral f of x this function f of x dx throughout on both sides taking g of x to the other side then you can easily check that you can do own integration and that will be i of some function of x x dot and this matrix lakshman and oscillator has the specific form f of x equal to lambda x by 1 minus lambda x square g of x equal to omega naught square x by 1 minus lambda x square if you substitute these forms f and g here then you find this i takes a very simple form in fact in 19 early 1970s i identified this f and g for certain reason and over the years this has been generalized and now we find this class and there are techniques and, and over the years this has been uh, once you know i how to find a hamiltonian how to find an l there is simple technique but in 1974 uh, supervisor p m matthews and lakshmanan we pointed out that if f and g has this particular form then you have this particular dynamical equation a highly complicated non linear dynamical system a non polynomial lagrangian system non polynomial dynamical equation it's not only non linear but non polynomial because you have term like 1 over 1 minus lambda x square lambda is the non non linearity parameter okay in both uh, these terms if lambda equal to 0 observe lambda equal to 0 this term drops down the denominator becomes 1 so you have just the harmonic oscillator x double dot plus omega not square x equal to 0 but because of the introduction of this uh, parameter you find that this is a highly uh, complicated non linear dynamical system and i pointed out in those days that this hamilton this equation of motion can be associated with a hamiltonian which has the form of into p square minus lambda into p square x square and p itself is not just x dot but x dot by 1 minus lambda x square 
So you have a velocity dependent potential. And in addition, you have this potential of omega naught square x square by 1 minus lambda x square. And you can also write down a Lagrangian, corresponding Lagrangian. So H has the form of P squared into F of x, where F of x has the form 1 over 1 minus lambda x square plus V of x is this uh, potential function. And this is what I was mentioning, generalization of, uh, of uh, um, uh, the standard Hamiltonian structure instead of p square by 2 plus v of x, I have f of x into p square plus v of x. So that is what uh, I'm getting here. But the most crucial aspect is that, or you can also interpret this uh, f of x as 1 over mass, the position dependent mass, standard form, you have of p square by 2m plus v of x, where m is constant. But here, m is a function of position x, which is equal to 1 over f of x. And here, this 1 over f of x is 1 over lambda, 1 minus lambda x square, and so on. Now, in nuclear physics nowadays, one finds such position-dependent uh, potentials are of crucial importance in condensed matter physics, and so on and so forth. But the important point is this ML oscillator has a very interesting structure in solution. I have pointed out at that time that this equation can be exactly solved in terms of harmonic functions. X of t equal to A cos omega t plus delta. So delta I have taken to be zero to satisfy the initial condition. That is not important. But this capital omega is now not just omega naught, the natural frequency of the harmonic oscillator, but omega naught by square root of 1 minus lambda i square, where A is the initial condition. So the frequency is amplitude dependent. So the general property of uh, typical nonlinear oscillator arises here also. But the functional form of the solution remains unchanged. So that is very fascinating. And the corresponding phase space structure takes very interesting uh, picture and so on. So this oscillator over the years have received enormous attention. And uh, so position dependent mass problems occur in very many uh, problems in condensed matter physics, quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera. Then in, uh, in uh, condensed matter and uh, nuclear physics and so on, you have to consider the corresponding quantum problem. So this is classical oscillator. The problem will arise. What happens when you go to quantum mechanics? Quantize the system. But quantum quantizing a Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian with the operator P, now the X becomes the position operator and P becomes the momentum canonically conjugate moment how will you represent p square into the equation but how will you represent p square into 1 minus lambda x square in quantum mechanics so that problem leads to what is known as ordering problem it requires ordering between momentum and mass operators in the kinetic energy term and appropriate boundary conditions has, has to be introduced and so on. So over the years, very many kinds of orderings have been uh, considered. And now we have certain, uh, certain uh, general prescription of taking care of this ordering problem. So all these problems have been uh, considered recently. We have considered the most uh, appropriate, most general ordering problem and we have solved, but very, many other people have introduced. But in those days, we made a simple ordering, just symmetrizing this uh, uh, momentum dependent, position dependent mass term. So instead of P square into one minus lambda x square, so I ordered this as P square into one minus lambda x square plus of the one minus lambda x square P square and replace P by I cross H D by DX and write down the corresponding Schrodinger equation and solve this problem, uh, solve this uh, eigenvalue problem, and we have found 
obtained the bound state spectrum and continuous spectrum, etc. So the bound state spectrum, for example, becomes n plus half cross h omega naught, which is nothing but the harmonic oscillator part. And then for the nonlinear part, non-polynomial part, you get the energy levels as n square plus n plus. one that condition okay so that problem has been solved and uh, later on uh, along with my senior uh, dr kumar ishwaran i had generalized this three to three dimensional problem classically and quantum mechanically and quantum problem leads to very many interesting properties symmetry algebra and ultimately leads to the notion of quantum groups and so on and the eigenvalue problem, eigenfunctions, et cetera, can be exactly solved, so on. In fact, that has led the, the Peter W. P. W. Hicks, which uh, Professor Bhaskaran was mentioning uh, several times uh, in his tool, Hicks Boson. So he wrote that in that uh, in those years, in 1979 paper in Journal of Physics, yeah, that the problem which we solved was the isotropic oscillator on a three sphere has been studied in the guise of a soluble nonlinear chiral model by Lakshmanan and Iswaran. So he generalized what uh, uh, I and uh, Kumar Iswaran had done, which is the generalization of this Lakshmanan oscillator to n dimension. And then he uh, considered the corresponding uh, spectrum and other things. So these kind of approaches is being pursued. Uh, <clears throat> several uh, works have been carried out over the years. Uh, perhaps I will skip all those details. And uh, you can consider this uh, uh, problem further and you can consider the most general uh, dynamical system which has the Linard type one, uh, which can lead to interesting uh, interesting uh, dynamical properties. Okay, uh, so that is one uh, particular area of what low-dimensional integrable dynamical system, which can lead to interesting uh, kinds of oscillators, uh, uh, oscillatory behavior. And in uh, recent times, we have also considered here damping. So instead of X you take a considered form just x dot. That again leads to very many interesting properties as we have found uh, during the past 10, 15 years. And ultimately in uh, 2005, Chandrasekhar Sendilver and myself, we have identified this oscillator, which if you observe carefully, it's x double dot plus alpha x x dot plus alpha square by nine x cube plus omega naught square x equal to zero. So if you drop the middle term, the second term, it is just the unharmonic oscillator whose solution is given in terms of elliptic function. And this position dependent, linearly position dependent uh, uh, mass term, uh, position dependent term into the dynamical equation. This equation becomes very, very uh, interesting. And uh, but until recently, this problem, uh, this dynamical system was not solved. But first, we identified through a method which we developed to approach these nonlinear dynamical problems. And we identified that this dynamical system can be identified with a first integral, which depends only on x dot and x. In this uh, rational form, which was very surprising that this damped term with position dependent, uh, I mean, position dependent uh, function can have such an integral. But more remarkably, we found once we have this time independent integral, we can associate a Lagrangian and Hamiltonian and you see the Lagrangian is a very complicated structure. There is nothing like kinetic energy minus potential energy. You have 
I have x dot, but it occurs in the denominator of z, and then you have a linear function. This fine Lagrangian equation it leads to exactly this dynamic equation, and this is a very well defined Lagrangian. It's very well defined function. So you can define a canonically conjugate momentum p equal to dl by dx dot, but this momentum has a complicated form. But it is a well-defined function, so you can define a Hamiltonian h equal to p x dot minus l. And that form has the structure h equal to half f of p x squared plus u of p. So, if you write this form, you you find f square then f of p f of p has this structure. And u of p has this complete. So this is a well-defined function Hamiltonian. Later on, Chitiga and myself uh, very uh, recently we have quantized this problem by going to over to momentum space. So a lot of interesting studies can be made, and it's uh, I can find the exact analytic solution. It leads to what is known as isochronous system and so on. So this kind of studies has been generalized to consider more and more general uh, uh, oscillator equations. So first order Riccati equations, second order this uh, the equation which I showed, third order, fourth order, nth order through a series of process, a chain of process. And I, we can generalize this to higher dimensions. And so on and so forth. So let me not go into those uh, systems examples as Bhaskar was repeatedly pointing out. Physicals play a very role in understanding physical systems. So completely integrable. So we ask the question: Why such systems become integrable? When we look at these problems, is that it has an interesting structure and in L, which is a two by where p equal to mx dot or just x dot m equal to m equal to 1. So consider a 2 by 2 matrix which is p by m omega x omega x minus p by m and a second operator a linear operator which is just 0 0 diagonal omega by 2 minus omega by 2. Then you consider a yeah, dynamical an operator equation which is called lax equation l dot equal to commutator of l and a that is l a minus a l bar operators for oscillator equation two operators so i can function linear operator l psi equal to lambda psi and psi t the time derivative equal to a size 2 leads to the lax equation. Now, making use of this in terms of two components expanding, I can show, I can find the exact solution as x equal to a sin omega t or a cos omega t plus delta and so on. So, associating two differential linear operators with a given dynamical system can lead to complete integrability. And we find exactly similar lax operators exist, for example, in the modified m done equation with operator L and an operator A. Similarly, for the Matthews Lakshman oscillator, now we find there exists an L, there exists an A, and making use of this and the corresponding uh, eigenvalue problem L psi equal to lambda psi 
साइटी इक्वल टू टेन एंड दिस आई कैन डेट इज वन सो द नॉलेज ऑफ दिस लैक्स Our identity within this notion of integrability to more general situations. When you consider these coupled oscillators, if I consider a system of oscillators defined by two second-order differential equations. then i can show if i can find two time independent integrals then i can solve this system and i can find its exact solutions and it will have nicer properties similarly for n coupled oscillators i can find n independent functionally independent integrals of motion then i can show the during the beginning of at the end of the world war during uh, na, na, late 1940s 1947 48 and so on the beginning so fermi was working at the los alamos national lab in the united states so for the war purpose a new machine a computing machine was uh, invented was designed by the great uh, mathematician mathematical physicist von neumann it's called maniac one m a n a n i a c machine for uh, numerical uh, integration and so on so, forth. so fermi wanted to understand the functioning of a computer so he asked these collaborators john pasta a mathematician and stand and see you long computer scientist to solve to solve so he chose this particular problem you have now only solve get it Well, Benny, hello. Sir, your voice is breaking, sir. Yeah, that this uh, problem uh, with the uh, power. Still, it is breaking, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. So, let, uh, okay. So, uh, network. Uh, uh, hopefully, it will. It will work. Uh, sorry about this. Oh. so that is uh, some uh, i think there may to uh, airtel so no in the plan i think i will yeah Shiba, sir, uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah, full screen mode. Yeah. So, for me, asked Pasta and Ulam to look at this problem of. oscillators getting coupled if linear oscillators are coupled by linear coupling which you study in your classical mechanics course i'm sure the first msc level 
you can always go to a new coordinate system you can make a linear transformation to what is known as normal mode decomposition and then you find that no energy sharing of this oscillators takes place but if introduce for introduce nonlinear coupling and so nonlinear forces what happens and that leads to some unusual phenomena fermi pasta ulam phenomena so essentially i have nonlinear oscillators and then you take nonlinear oscillators coupled by linear and other couplings and then add effect of damping forcing delay the problem becomes more and more complicated and that's what i have yesterday pointed out collective dynamical states but let me now consider this fermi pasta ulam problem so that was carried out during the period 1954 and 55 as i said under the suggestion of enrico fermi by john pasta and stanley ulam and by the time the results were coming out fermi died because of cancer but these people john pasta and stanley ulam didn't want to publish these results without the approval of enrico fermi however they wrote their results as an internal report of los alamos laboratory la 1940 the the number of that report la 1940 in the year 1955 they wrote this paper studies of nonlinear problems so this is the first page of that report so it says that a one dimensional dynamical system of 64 particles with forces uh, between neighboring uh, neighbors containing nonlinear terms has been studied by los alamos computer maniac 1 the nonlinear terms considered were quadratic uh, cubic and broken linear types the results are analyzed into fourier components plotted on a <clears throat> as a function of time the results the last line is the most famous line it says the results show very little if any tendency towards equipartition of energy among the degrees of freedom so what fermi asked them to check whether equipartition of energy which is very basic in statistical mechanics is valid for this 64 particle system so this is the dynamics which they have studied dynamics of a chain of weakly coupled nonlinear oscillators so you have a chain of oscillators 0 1 2 3 1 to n oscillators n equal to 32 or 64 for certain uh, reasons they have taken it as powers of 2 okay 2 power 2 4 2 power 3 8 etc so 2 power uh, uh, some 8 as 32 or 64 and so on and then between two nearest neighbors atoms they assume the forces are only between nearest neighbors ith particle interacts only with i minus 1 and i plus 1 and no more than that so you have the newton's equation of motion the rate of change of momentum the second derivative of displacement oi so the displacement the longitudinal displacement of the ith particle is defined by oi and that is related to oi plus 1 and oi minus 1 so there is a functional dependence and this function could be a linear function plus a quadratic function a linear function plus cubic function and a broken linearity so if you do that as i said if you have just a linear chain then the equation of motion becomes this and you can make a linear transformation to normal modes instead of the modes uh, oi is variables you can go to a new define a new set of coordinates ai is and uh, make a fourier transform a uh, fourier series representation and substitute into this and you get the equations for the new coordinates aj is as aj double dot plus omega j square aj where omega j square are some constants so they get completely separated out so that the total energy of this oscillator becomes sum of this individual normal modes no energy 
distribution occurs. But uh, ecopartisan theorem says in statistic mechanics, if you have a large number of particles and if they are interacting, even under linear force, there will be possibilities of exchange of energy. And if you wait for sufficiently long time, all the modes will get equally energy distributed equally. And in particular, what happens if nonlinear forces are included, just like this, this kind of nonlinear force? Where is it? Yeah, this kind of nonlinear force. If alpha or beta is zero, it's just linear force. If nonlinear force are added, then you have a system of nonlinear dynamical equations. And in that case, what happens? So this plot, this is the famous Fermi pasta Ulam plot of energy. So what is plotted here is the energy in the various normal modes. So for example, if you take 60 system of 64 mass points, you will have 64 normal modes in the linear representation, in the linear normal mode representation. So you give the energy and they chose the energy in such a way that initial energy distribution is the first mode got the maximum energy, the second mode, a very small energy, and all the other modes almost zero energy. So energy was distributed. The initial condition was chosen such that most of the energy was given to the first mode and very little energy to the other modes. And then you introduce this nonlinear coupling, nonlinear force, and allow the system to evolve and you calculate the corresponding energies of the individual normal modes. As time progresses in some normalized coordinates of time, you find that energy, yes, they get redistributed. But as time progresses, you find the second mode gains energy, the third mode gains energy, fourth mode gains energy, and so on. So there is a redistribution of energy. But to their great surprise, after characteristic time, a characteristic recurrence time, the first mode regains its energy back completely. Okay. Almost 99.999% of energy comes back to the first mode. And the second mode loses most of the energy. The other modes get zero energy. And then again, this repeats. This goes on again up for 165 time units. And then again, it repeats. So this problem is being analyzed again and again. Even now, this Fermi pasta Ulam problem is being uh, analyzed through, new, through supercomputers and all. So still, equipartition doesn't occur. So this showed, I mean, this created, even though it was Allah Salama's internal report, soon this news came out, I mean, started spreading to other scientists, other physicists and mathematicians. So everybody was interested in analyzing this problem and checking what is happening in this uh, dynamical system. Energy propagation in an unharmonic lattice. Dynamics of a chain of weakly coupled nonlinear oscillators. Collective dynamical motion, how the energy gets propagated. There is no equipartition of energy. So what happens? So different people have started looking at this problem in a different manner. And a group at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, headed by Martin Kreskel and Norman Zabuski, they took up this problem and approached this problem in a particular way, which you normally do in your classical mechanics. You take the continuum limit. In the sense, let us assume that there are a large number of particles in this one-dimensional lattice. And there are, since the number is so large, you can treat the equilibrium distance between the different particles is almost zero. So you take the limit, the equilibrium distance among the different modes is tending to zero. So that y of n, y n of t, the nth displacement of the nth particle is y into n of a. You start from one end for the nth particle, n into a. The a is the equilibrium distance between the nearest neighbors. So O e equal O e into N of A into T. And since N is very large and A is very small, you can write uh, combined as a continuous variable X, O e of X T. And the nearest neighbor, you can make a Taylor expansion. So you can 
take derivatives. So substitute all these derivatives into the equation of motion. When there is, if you drop the non-linearity, you just get the wave equation. The linear waves, the standard linear waves in a, in a string, for example. But the linear waves leads to uh, non-dispersive waves. And there is no possibility of energy sharing, uh, the, the kind of phenomena that I have explained. And now you take the next order after suitable modification and you go to the higher order contribution coming from these terms and take this contribution uh, corresponding to alpha and in this uh, lattice parameter. And then with suitable modification, suitable change of uh, coordinates, you ultimately end up for describing the energy propagation in that unharmonic lattice, a possible equation, this third order partial, non-linear partial differential equation. Partial differential equation now. So there will be two dynamical, two independent variables, T as well as X, which I have introduced here. OEN of T becomes now a continuous variable. NA becomes X. And T is already a continuous variable. So as a consequence, you get a partial differential equation du by dt, first derivative, dq by dx cube. So these are all linear terms, but u into du by dx. So that leads to a nonlinear, that is the nonlinear part. And so this is a fully nonlinear partial differential equation, a nonlinear wave equation. But you know, if you have a linear wave equation, you know the standard forms of waves, linear progressing waves, for example infinite number of uh, possible waves, a single wave. You take a combination of two such waves with wave numbers near to each other. Then you combine them. The, you have the phenomenon of beats. There are regions where the amplitude is increased. There are regions where amplitude is decreased. So you take three such waves, four such waves, 100 such waves, 1,000 such waves. So when you take more and more number of waves, you, you make a Fourier sum. Then you find the combined wave structure exhibits a localized structure. If you take the, the envelope of this structure, you have essentially uh, oscillatory waves and you move away from the center, which where the amplitude dies down quickly. The maximum amplitude is uh, in the center and this is the wave packet. So this wave packet contains groups of waves, wave groups. So this Wave packet travels with its own velocity, group velocity, whereas the individual waves like this have their phase velocity. And the wave velocity and the phase velocity and the group velocity will never be equal to each other. And such waves are called linear dispersive waves. And since this information, for example, in a radio station from a radio station or a television station normally, is sent in this form of wave packets. But as the wave packet propagates, it travels with its own velocity while the individual waves start moving with their own phase velocities. As a consequence, dispersion occurs, damping occurs, and because of dispersion, the waves get, uh, and the amplitude gets diced down. And so there is no possibility of permanent waves. But if you have a wave like this, so this particular equation is now called Kotebeck debris equation, which was orig originally deduced by the Dutch physicists Kotebeck and debris in the journal Philosophical Magazine in the year 1895 to describe a phenomena that was identified by John Scott Russell in the year 1839, which he observed in the Union Canal connecting the cities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, and where he identified water waves propagating without change of form or diminution of speed. And in order to explain that, starting from the first principles of hydrodynamics, fluid dynamics, Kotebeck and Debris deduced similar equation. 
So exactly same equation occurred, uh, has been deduced by uh, Martin Kreskel and Norman Zabriskie to describe the, the Fermi pasta Ulam phenomena of uh, unharmonic lattice. The point is that this equation admits elliptic function base. This elliptic function I, I pointed out in the beginning and one limit when modulus parameter goes to zero, CN, SN, etc., they become cos or sine, the harmonic functions. But when the modulus parameter goes to one, they become hyperbolic function. As a consequence, Kotabag and Debris in 1895 itself pointed out that this equation admits a solitary wave, a single isolated wave of the form secant h square. Look at a function secant h square x. It will have this kind of structure from the from minus infinity to plus infinity x. You find only in a localized area around x equal to zero, secant h and secant h square function will have non-zero value and very fast it, it falls down and goes to zero. So this is a single isolated wave in contrast to the infinite number of possible progressing waves. Normally you have sine or cosine waves. So when you have an appropriate nonlinear dynamical system, and this is a nonlinear dispersive system. And because of this nonlinearity, if this nonlinearity is there, is not there, then you have a linear dispersive system, you have a linear dispersion relation, etc. I will not go into those details. But because of this nonlinearity parameter, you have a nonlinear dispersive wave equation, and it, it can admit for suitable nonlinearity, which balances this dispersion term, linear dispersion is balanced by this nonlinear term, nonlinear forcing term, then it can lead to an isolated wave, single isolated wave, which can propagate without change of form or diminution of speed. And more importantly, you also observe here that this is C or C by two is the amplitude. And if you look at the velocity, that is also proportional to C. The larger the wave, the larger is the velocity and vice versa. So you have a wave which propagates without change of form or diminution of speed, but which also whose size also depends on the velocity or the velocity depends on the size. So such a uh, unique, such an interesting structure arises. And Zabisky and Kraskal went on to analyze this nonlinear partial differential equation in a more uh, intricate way in, uh, by analyzing this exactly numerically. And the consequences of this numerical analysis, this is Martin Kraskal, who was a collaborator with us, who visited Trichy many times, uh, but uh, uh, fortunate, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago. And uh, Norman Zaguski and Martin Kreskel, they analyzed this problem of quarterback debris equation under periodic boundary conditions. So they started with an initial condition, which is half of a cosine wave. They allowed the system numerically to propagate. And then intermediate time, this dashed curve some complicated curve. But if you wait for sufficiently long time, they found a series of pulses of smaller and larger and smaller amplitudes. And as I point, and these are all exactly the solitary wave forms which I had uh, pointed out here. And because of the structure of these uh, waves, the larger wave will travel with larger velocity. So this one will soon catch up with the smaller wave and then the question arises, what will happen when these two waves interact? But to their great surprise, they wait for sufficiently long time. The larger wave interacts, but then comes out without change of form, and then interacts with the next wave, next wave, next wave. After a character's time, it comes back to its original state. So the, recur the, the recursion that occurs in the unharmonic lattice, the phenomena of recursion occurs, also occurs in these uh, solutions of this Kotovac-Debris equation 
uh, in this in this particular analysis and so on. So the Fermi pasta Ulam uh, results are exp explained by this analysis, but this also leads to a new possible anal analytic structure. Namely, you take two solitary waves, allow them to evolve according to the Kotabek debris sequence. So here I have uh, given the plot of this function u of the Kotabek debris equation as a function of x and t. So at large t, negative, for convenience, I start from negative uh, t value. So you take two such waves and allow them to propagate in one direction. This is a unidirectional wave propagation. So as we have seen, the larger wave will travel with higher velocity. So soon it will catch up with the smaller wave, interact. But then after interaction, you find that the smaller one is left, uh, left to the left and the larger one is, comes to the right. And as a consequence, there is only a phase shift that takes place. It's just like a billiard ball collision. Without, apart from that, there is no other change in the structure of the solitary waves. So such solitary waves, even under collision, when they retain their shape and structure, the, the Wisk and Kruskal call them as solitons, just like photons, protons, etc. So particle-like structure. That is the birth of solitons, new physics, and uh, under the name of integrable dynamical systems. Now we know that this Kotabek debris equation is a nonlinear partial differential equation. It's a Hamiltonian system. And it's an infinite dimensional integrable nonlinear dynamical system. So soliton is essentially solitary wave which retains its shape and speed under collision, except for a phase shift, elastic collision. And the underlying problem can be now exactly solved using a, a, a new method, which is a generalization of Fourier transform method. So here you have the initial value problem given the initial value u of x zero under suitable forms of u of x zero, then uh, you can carry out an analysis uh, involving the lax pairs. So it has been shown by Kruskal and his co-workers, the Kotabek debris equation can be associated with a pair of two linear differential operator. The first one is the Schrodinger spectral problem L equal to minus d square by dx square plus u of xt, so that L psi equal to lambda psi, in which the unknown function occurs as a coefficient in here. And then consider a second linear differential operator, which is a third order linear differential operator, in which again the u occurs as coefficients, u and its derivatives. Now you look for the lax equation Lt equal to Bl minus Lb the result of which is the Kotabek debris equation. So the knowledge of this L and B allows one to develop a new mathematical technique. So starting from the initial condition, you can carry out a direct scattering analysis. You get scattering data at the initial time. And then the time evolution becomes using the second of the equation, psi t equal to b psi, a very trivial one. You can get scattering data at future instant of time. You can invert that by solving a series of uh, linear integral equations and you can get back the solution. So it's a very beautiful mathematical analysis that one can carry out. The result of which you can get a single solitary wave solution depending on the initial condition. You can get a more general soliton solution, two soliton solution. And when these two soliton solutions plotted, it's exactly this uh, structure that comes out. So like that, you can solve the Cauchy initial value problem completely analytically. So these kind of solitary waves then can be related to, for example, the 2004 tsunami, which struck the East Coast. So starting from off Sumatra, uh, an earthquake of, uh, of uh, this test scale 9.4, etc., which uh, took place here because of that huge waves were created. And this, because of this, these waves uh, started propagating. And when they approached the coast, for example, when it approached the coast of, uh, of uh, Thailand, for example, huge mass of water, etc., then these kind of tsunamis can be uh, 
associated with the solitary wave, soliton, soliton structure, and so on. So we have analyzed this uh, in a conference that uh, was held in 2009 in Kolkata and so on. So these kind of soliton systems have been identified in many other uh, interesting uh, physical situations. Magnetic soliton, Heisenberg ferromagnetic spin chain. So I had shown that uh, it can be uh, related to such uh, magne uh, solid, uh, magnetic solitons. In optical fibers, you have nonlinear Schrodinger equation again, the form of optical solitons and uh, long Josephson junctions again, uh, solitons. And uh, so many, many other equations you identify in solitons. In fact, uh, in coupled, uh, uh, coupled nonlinear Schrodinger type equations, you can even uh, show that logic gates can be generated. So computers, computation with uh, optical solitons is also possible, which uh, with my student Radha Krishnan, I have shown uh, that such uh, uh, collisions with uh, uh, corresponding to optical logic gates can be uh, identified. So a lot of progress has been made in recent times. We have uh, shown very many novel interactions uh, involving solitons uh, structures. Um, so very recently one talks about rogue waves, waves which suddenly appears and then disappears in no time and so on. So such structures can also be analyzed uh, through uh, these studies. So unfortunately I cannot go into the fuller details, but what I have tried to point out was that it's not only uh, complex chaotic uh, structures that arises when you consider nonlinear forces. But you can also, under appropriate circum circumstances, for suitable nonlinear force, and when you have uh, uh, wave propagation, etc., dispersion and uh, nonlinearity are balanced suitably, you can get very interesting structures. And mathematically, you can trace them, you can find the new, uh, develop new techniques, and you can study their properties completely. And they can be useful for very many practical purposes, including optical soliton prop information propagation in optical fibers, nonlinear uh, optical fiber. So, you know, the area of uh, uh, nonlinear optics, which is uh, being well developed, and so on. So, there are many areas in which this uh, theory of integrable systems and soliton systems are playing crucial role. So integrable nonlinear dynamical systems continue to provide fascinating mathematical and physical concepts and notions. They have considered considerable physical implications. Many unsolved and challenging problems remain to be investigated and hopefully newer techniques will be developed to handle them soon. I do hope that some of the young people in this audience and your friends extra will in due course will be able to tackle some of these problems. So some useful uh, references, uh, this book, Ablovitz, Clarks and Solitons, Nonlinear Evolution Equation, Inverse Scattering, and the book by uh, Lexman, myself and Raj Shekhar, Nonlinear Dynamics, Integrability, Chaos and Patterns, uh, Springer, Encyclopedia of Nonlinear Science, uh, and then this book by Babylon, etc., introduction to classical integrable systems and so on. So there are, uh, so these are some of the basic references uh, I can point out. Uh, and uh, I do hope that, um, uh, that I have given some uh, basic idea regarding these uh, novel structures. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, comments, etc., you are welcome to ask me now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The session is open for discussion. Thanks, Participants sir. are requested to post your questions in the chat box. Yeah. So, uh, any uh, any questions uh, either on this uh, lecture or on the earlier lecture or, or any other related problems, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. I don't find the, yeah. So any, so anybody wants to ask any questions and any of the basic properties of these systems? 
I think Ramakrishnan has already come. So, if <clears throat> okay, then I, I I don't find any questions. So I, I do hope that this breaking of uh, voice in in between didn't uh, didn't uh, uh, disturb the lecture much. No, sir. Sir, one small question. Yes. Uh, sir, Hamiltonian is, is is it is a it is just a, a sum of kinetic energy plus potential energy. So Hamiltonian is nothing but the total energy of the system. Yeah, Hamiltonian is the total energy of the system, but uh, uh, but the, the the form which you which you write, maybe you can. You can distinguish, uh, uh, separate out as uh, kinetic energy and potential energy in the standard uh, form. But you can have structures, you can have systems for which you cannot distinguish this kinetic energy and potential energy in a clear fashion. And that's what I have pointed out for some of the uh, nonlinear systems which we have uh, studied. Such distinctions cannot be made. But yet, you have a quantity called total energy, which is conserved. Okay, so that is the structure which I had uh, pointed out uh, when you have, uh, for example, this uh, uh, Linard type 2, what I call as Linard type 2 uh, kind of systems. So, which uh, have this. So, it's a generalization of the standard uh, property of uh, standard notion of uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy. So what is required is that the canonical equations, Hamilton's canonical equation has to be satisfied by this function. Then the principle of least action will hold good. So you will have a quantity which is conserved in time and uh, so which is a constant of motion. So you can associate that as the energy. So the, the distinction between kinetic and potential energy is, is uh, very special, I think. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, shall we associate the Lagrangian to any of the physical quantity of the system? Yeah, normally you don't associate Lagrangian with uh, any physical system, but it is the Hamiltonian which you can associate with, uh, with the physical quantity. So Lagrangian, you can associate with uh, uh, every physical, integrable physical system, you can identify an appropriate Lagrangian, or you can identify a Hamiltonian from which you can identify a Lagrangian, or if you find a Lagrangian from which you can associate uh, finding the canonically conjugate momentum, you can uh, identify an appropriate Hamiltonian. Okay. So, Identifying a Lagrangian will help you to identify appropriate integrals of motion. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? If not, uh, perhaps I can uh, I can leave. Okay, then I think uh, I can leave now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll start the next session. Yeah, I will uh, I've stopped shared, yeah. Okay. I leave? Yeah. Yes, I invite Dr. M. Ilandrayan, oh. Associate Professor, to introduce our speaker. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I feel honored and privileged to introduce Professor V. Ramakrishnan, UGC, BSR faculty fellow, former head, Department of Laser Studies, School of Physics, Madurai Kamarajar University, Madurai, to audience. Professor V. Ramakrishnan is a distinguished researcher, 
and research administrator and also one of the famous scientists in our country. Formerly, he is secured, served as a director, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Thiruvananthapuram. Also, mentor director, Indian Institute of Information Technology, Kottayam. He has vast administrative record as a scientist in various institute, institutes across in our country. He is a recipient of many international fellowship for his scholarship and research. Few of them I mentioned here. Commonwealth Academic Fellow, University of Bristol, UK. Federation Arrangement Visitor, International Center for Theoretical Physics, Italy. SVBL Researcher, University of Electrocommunication, Tokyo, Japan. Invitation Fellow, University of Electrocommunication, Tokyo, Japan. In connection with research collaboration, he visited more than 15 foreign countries, few of them United Kingdom, Singapore, Japan, France, Ireland, Italy, etc. He has received many awards and honors for his research careers, few of them. He got award international level, that is fellow Institute of Physics, London, member matching American Physical Society, USA, and national level, he got BSR Faculty Fellowship, UGC, life member, Indian Laser Association, Junior Research Fellowship, UGC, Senior Research Fellowship, CSIR, in state level, Tamil Nadu Scientist Award and Fellow Tamil Nadu Academy of Science. On research contribution side, he published more than uh, nearly 170 uh, research papers that is reviewed, uh, pre-reviewed journals, international journals. And he published 115 national and international conference research papers. He gave more than 45 keynote address and invited lectures in national and international level conference and seminars and workshops. He completed many Indian level projects and grant received more than in lakhs. In research side, more than that is 22 PhD scholar awarded under his able guidance, 27 MPhil students awarded in his guidance. In summary, he is a famous institutional builder along with good researchers. So I am very happy and honored, sir, to invite you present talk to speaker. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, it gives me an opportunity to uh, meet Professor Lashman and our philosopher, our, our mentor. And uh, thanks for the good words from Professor Ravi Chandran. Uh, it's a uh, immense pleasure for me to take uh, or to deliver lectures for the young minds of our state. <clears throat> okay, let me go with uh, my. Excuse me, it should uh, go with the... Hello, Ravi Chandran. Yes, sir. So, because uh, there is, I have put the file in the desktop. Okay, sir. How to take it out? Because share. 
Okay, it does not show my basic advanced PowerPoint computer audio files. Share screen option will be there, sir. Pardon? Share screen option. There is a share screen. Okay. Your bottom share. of the screen. Yeah, says share, yeah. share screen. Yeah. That's yeah. Please okay. click that button, sir. Then okay. you can see the screen. Then okay, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Click the screen and then uh, right side, uh, you can, uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, this is fine. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Visible, okay. sir. Okay. Double click the lecture one, sir. Slide PPT. It is not yet open. To me, it's open. Lecture one. Yes, sir. Slide is there. Okay, now it's see. Now you can see. Ah, yes, yes, sir. It's perfect. So, uh, once again, uh, I'm going to present uh, some of the works uh, which we are we have done last uh, ten years or uh, so. But I just try to start from the fundamentals. So this is a nice photograph of Professor C. V. Raman. So there is a quote from him in the bottom: a "Fundamental science cannot be driven by instructional, industrial, and government or military pressures. It has to be inculcated, and the attitude has to come, and uh, the science has to grow." So this is a noting of Professor K. S. Krishnan on his diary. Uh, professor was there, and we proceeded to examine the influence of the wavelength of instant light on the phenomenon. On examining the track with a direct vision spectroscope, we found to our great surprise that the modified scattering was separated from the scattering corresponding to the instant light by a dark region. The Raman effect had been discovered. A newspaper announcement was made on the following day, that is February 29th. Historic paper of Raman and Krishnan announced the discovery of Raman effect that is published in Nature, uh, March 1928. To commemorate the legacy of Professor C.V. Raman, 28 February has been designated as the National Science Day, the day in which day on uh, Raman effect was discovered. So this is a um, cable from um, Professor R. W. Wood on Professor Raman's work. It appears to me this is a very beautiful discovery which resulted from Raman's long and patient study of the phenomenon of light scattering. That is one of the fun, one of the most convincing proofs of the quantum theory of light. He also made a significant work with the musical instruments, that is acoustics. He was the first person to for investigating harmonic nature of Mridangam and Jabela. One of his students is Nagendra Nath. There is a famous work with him is the Raman Nath diffraction, that is acoustic effect. Master students who are following optical electronics by Ajay Gatak and Tyagarajan. There are a couple of chapters on this acoustic effect. Then Professor Raman has worked on magnetic and electrical encyclopedia, human vision, physiology, and optics of solid. There's a book written by Professor G. Venkata Raman on journey into light. So these are uh, three instruments which I uh, present and showing it to the students. The, what is on the less, top left is the Raman spectrometer, which he has used for the discovery of Raman effect. Uh, people, if you go to IAC Bangalore and the first floor of the administrative building, it has a one. And the, what is on the right top is a Spex Romolog spectrometer. Uh, this was uh, the instrument which I used. Is in fact I, when I was about 25 years old, this photograph was taken. I was just looking at the strip chart of it. Later, it was come the automation. Everything has happened. Well, what you see with myself is a macro Raman spectrometer. What is in the bottom is a micro Raman spectrometer. So the development goes from a spectrograph 
uh, dispersion monochromator uh, um, setup and uh, CCD attached uh, micro Raman spectrometer. So uh, we know molecules carbon tetrac uh, that is CH4 methane. It has tetrahedral symmetry and uh, SF6 it has octahedral symmetry and benzene DCH. It's um, um, these three molecules they have very high molecular symmetry that is tetrahedral, octahedral, D6H symmetry. So if you look at benzene, uh, just to put, uh, you replace one hydrogen with the chlorine atom, um, the symmetry has reduced from D6H point group to CTB point group. So just a uh, substitution by another atom has influenced the symmetry of the atom molecule. That reduction in the symmetry or that modification in the molecular structure will be reflected in the spectroscopic, spectroscopic studies. So there are various spectroscopic techniques starting from um, radio waves to uh, gamma rays. Or, uh, spectroscopy is nothing but uh, interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter. The ultimate aim is to um, do the understand atomic and molecular structure. The energy of the molecule can be classified into three categories, or uh, more precisely, rotational, vibrational, and electronic. So transition between electronic states, uh, the branch of spectroscopy is electronic spectroscopy. The transition between rotational states, uh, the microwave or far infrared, and the transition between uh, vibrational states that is infrared spectroscopy. So, uh, the molecular motion that is, uh, you can describe the transition of electrons in the various orbitals and the transition from various uh, vibration states and the transition between rotation states. So, uh, the energy separation is high in the electronic states, and next is vibration states, then the rotation state. So, each electronic state has many vibration states, each vibration state has many rotation states. So, energy change due to a reversal of spin. Um, that is the orientation of the spin change with respect to the external magnetic field, that is the nucleus or ele electron, that is the nuclear magnetic resonance and electron spin resonance or EPR. The energy change involving the inner electrons of an atom, that is you look at the core electron transitions, that is the X-ray spectroscopy, then the rearrangement of nuclear particles, that is the gamma ray spectroscopy. So let me just go to the boroatom model of an electronic transition the hydrogen atom. So, a uh, downward transition involves an emission of photon energy. So, that is a famous uh, hydrogen atom energy level expression, which needs to be two pi square mu for square. Uh, one divided by n square minus one pi into square, that is equal to 30 minus 13.6, is into that um, terms within the bracket and expressed in terms of the electron volts. That is the fundamental thought of Bohr, that is, <clears throat> when um, Absorption takes place, an atom uh, in the ground lower energy level goes to the higher energy level by absorbing an amount of energy equal to the energy difference. As we say, the photon. And uh, when the excited atoms, molecules return to the ground state uh, by emitting an energy equal to the energy difference, we say, the photon. So uh, when they absorb or they emit, so you'll get a spectrum and a spectrum is nothing but a data which has a, along the x-axis you have the wavelength or wave number on the y-axis you have the transmittance or absorbance or the intensity. So it is a frequency distribution or the wavelength distribution. Um, so line spectrum is one which consists of well-defined sharp lines. And band spectrum is nothing but it's composed of bands or the closely, it can of closely spaced lines. So generally the atomic spectrum will be very sharp. So the line spectrum arises from the atomic transitions, whereas the band spectrum, um, it arises from the molecular motions or the, from the molecular, uh, molecular transitions. So the intensity of the spectral lines, these are some of the fundamentals that it tells the transition probability from one energy level to another energy level. And also the population uh, involved in the transition 
of course there are various mechanism on the width of the spectral line just what you see is that indian street is the peak height and just to the spread the, the spread the width depends on many mechanism the line broadening uh it has a collisional broadening uh, and homogeneous heterogeneous line broadening there are various mechanisms which contribute to them um line broadening basically the fundamentally if the line is very short um, and the width is low, people just look at them lifetime of the excited state so let me go to a molecule there are n number of atoms so if there are n number of atoms then it will have a uh, 3n degrees of freedom so that is um, you try to describe the atoms in 3n different ways and among the 3n degrees of freedom then you have a um, translational degrees of freedom and rotational degrees of freedom and the vibrational degrees of freedom so all together that contribute to them the 3n degrees of freedom so normal modes what is that suppose you have a now three if you have a non linear molecule among the 3n normal modes among the 3n degrees of freedom uh three corresponds to the translational motion because if you look at them three dimensional system and uh, rotational motion about the center of gravity along x y z so you have 3 plus 3 then you subtract so you'll have a it is a non linear molecule you have a 3n minus 6 degrees of freedom then if it is a linear molecule the rotation about the bond axis do not contribute to anything so you have 3n minus 5 degrees of vibrational degrees of freedom or you can say 3n minus 5 normal modes of vibrations that is in this way it vibrates so if the water molecule is a non linear molecule there are three modes uh, it's a symmetric stretching symmetric bending and anti symmetric stretch as carbon dioxide is a linear four modes as three uh, into 3 minus 5 four symmetric stretch and anti symmetric stretch and a symmetric bending that is a doubly degenerate vibration so several types of vibrations that is example stretching motion between two banded atoms that is have what you see on the right side the symmetric stretching of the water molecule which occurs at 365 to wave number the energy transition wave number associated is that 365 to wave number and an anti symmetric anti symmetric stretching that is at the bottom that is 3756 wave number the bending motion is a uh, between the three atoms connected by two on the bond angle changes so the symmetric stretch or uh, the two bonds are being stretched um, at the same time whereas in the anti symmetric stretching one bond is extended another bond is contracted so that uh, vibration frequency occurs at the higher end so there are these are the three vibrational motion of the water molecule or you have a fundamentally you have three vibrational frequencies or vibration allowed transitions for the water molecule um so if you just uh, have uh, if you look at the part is missing uh, yeah, that is i took it in the other way so when a molecule is placed in an external magnetic external electric field or the field experienced by the molecule is a e and the polarization is induced that polarization p is equal to alpha into e where alpha is the uh, molecular polarizability or just nothing like it measures the deformation of the electronic cloud uh, by the external field so p is equal to alpha e and uh, e you can write in terms of e is equal to cos 2 pi nu 0 t and uh, alpha is the molecular polarizability it is a symmetric system uh, it's a uh, if it is an isotropic system then uh, it is a scalar quantity if it is an anisotropic system it's a tensor component so you will have um, alpha x x alpha y y alpha z z alpha x y alpha y y z and alpha z x probably if it is a symmetric tensor you have alpha x y is equal to alpha y x like that so you have six components so you can write the uh, px component that is the polar induced polarization the x component of the induced polarization so you write and um, you have a expression so the first term which says that it is uh, a classical the dipole oscillates at the frequency uh, nu not whereas the second term you have it oscillates nu not plus or minus nu v nu v is the vibration frequency of the molecule so yeah you have nu not plus nu v and nu not minus nu v so you have a higher frequency component and a lower frequency component so the lower frequency component is the stokes and the higher frequency component is the anti stokes so if you look at a fluorescence uh, you the teacher might have taught you 
uh, tomorrow also I'm giving a lecture on fluorescence. When a high frequency uh, radiation falls on a system, uh, low frequency radiation is emitted. That is, suppose if the dye is there. Suppose uh, the dye is um, green dye. So it absorbs radiations which have frequencies greater than uh, green. So you may absorb uh, blue or UV radiations, but it emits green radiations. So what you have in the fluorescence is always the uh, low frequency components. That is, uh, that is what they call the Stokes component. That is the Stokes components, the Stokes frequencies. So in the fluorescence, you always get only the low frequency components. Whereas in the Roman, you get the low frequency components and also the high frequency component. So uh, what is the definition is that when a beam of monochromatic radiation falls on a molecular system, um, you have elastically scattered photons and inelastically scattered photons. The elastically scattered photons go to a um, the light scattering, the inelastically scattered photons go to Raman. The inelastically scattered photons, they have frequencies above that of the incident one and frequencies below that of the incident one. So that is what that I told you in the classical age. This is a energy level diagram. So you have infrared absorption, the light scattering. So you hatch new knot, it goes to the virtual level, then comes back. Uh, that's an elastic process. In the stroke scattering, it goes from the ground level to the virtual level and uh, emits to the um, first excited level, that is uh, the level the vibration level is V0, V is equal to zero, that is V is equal to one, it comes to the V is equal to one. Whereas in the anti stroke it goes from V is equal to one to the virtual level, it comes to, uh, and emits the photon, comes to the V is equal to zero. So in the stroke scattering, you have um, H nu zero minus H nu m, whereas in the anti strokes you have H nu zero plus H nu m. So in both cases, the energy difference is the H nu m. So that is uh, important. That is whatever may be the frequency of the excitation, the Raman shift, the shift uh, between the incident one, the absorbed frequency, the shift remains the same. So <clears throat> that shift is the characteristics of the molecule. That shift reflects the change in the vibrational, rotational, electronic energy levels of the molecule. So if you have a phosphate ion, um, you have the, these are the um, allowed Raman lines, 936, 420, 1004, and 573 as a total symmetry. So I just put H2PO4 ion. So you have the symmetry is reduced from tetrahedral to C2V. Earlier, I told you the methane, CCL4, PO4, all has to talk higher order symmetry. But you just substitute, you add uh, just a phosphate ion, pure phosphate ion, it goes to dihydrogen phosphate ion, the symmetry got reduced. When the symmetry got reduced, um, the number of Laman lines are more and the frequencies are different. So if uh, you have a material, you don't know whether it is a PO4 3 minus ion, H2PO4 minus ion. You take Raman. If you have this uh, four lines, then uh, then you can say it's a phosphate ion. If you have the nine lines and with the frequency corresponding to that, with a plus R minus plus R two minus plus R minus five inverse, you can say that it is a dihydrogen phosphate ion. So um, any spectroscopic, like any spectroscopic technique, Raman spectroscopy always provides you the, the structure or the symmetry of the molecule. Once you know the symmetry of the molecule, you must know uh, what is its interaction with the neighbor. So once I identify the component, once I identify the component, you try to understand its symmetry. Once you know the symmetry, then you can look at uh, its um, interactions with the neighbor. So you can have a intramolecular interactions and the intermolecular interaction. Now you have an orthochlorobin solidified you have it's a simple uh, benzaldehyde liquid. You have um, a carbonyl group and a chlorine, and uh, you have um, the carbonyl group. You have um, strong frequency common line at the seventeen hundred. Okay, and there is a solid solidehyde. So here you have. Uh, a, car a carbonyl group that oxygen has an intramolecular hydrogen bonding. So generally, I should uh, around uh, 1638. Uh, I just round out. There are two lines. So whereas the earlier we have seen only one line, whereas in the other case we have seen two lines. The two lines, the two lines says that 
there are two different carbonyl groups that is one has an intramolecular hydrogen bonding another does not have an intramolecular hydrogen bonding that means something will come into that it is being destroyed so uh, in a mixture of a neat salt solvent you have 50% or 60% because the industry is more for the free carbonyl groups so more number of free carbonyl groups than the intramolecular hydrogen bonded carbonyl groups so just a neat spectrum okay 1638 and 1658 now uh, the same thing uh, if you look at uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, its frequencies and uh, because i mix uh, solid halide with a dimethyl formamide and uh, i try to plot a line so it's almost a straight line does not matter but something is that what you have is a uh, something like a, something increases and comes down like that it's almost like a broad end one it is not showing a signature like this it's not showing like a linear plot but it is this is what you have bandwidth that is i am measuring the line width at every concentration it is not just increasing or it is not just decreasing it show it increases and it comes down so that means uh, what wants at one stage the molecular motions are restricted by the environment so it's something like a cause so the bandwidth increases you know uh, once it reaches the 50% ratio then it is not in the cause it just gets liberalized so it is not having any interaction with the neighbors so it is the bandwidth starts to come down so uh, what just to one look at it so this i mixed a solvent with another one i just to take because i have to see that it shows a linear trend so if you have a liquid prism experiment hollow prism experiment you have 10 ml of water add 1 gram of 1 gram of sugar then another 10 ml of water add 2 grams of sugar another 10 ml 3 grams so you have some tins uh, solutions uh, so you take the refractive index against the concentration it will show the linear variation because what you are measuring is the macroscopic property but here what i am just looking at the uh, inter and intramolecular interaction how it affects the line width the spectral line width so it's an interesting signature where it increases then it falls down now this is another case where in which uh, there is a htpo for ion there is another htpo for uh, sorry h uh, yes oh, htpo for ion another htpo for ion another hpo4 ion so each hpo4 ion is linked with a water mole so you have a layer in which hpo4 ions are connected by a water mole uh, it goes the first one and the second one and each layer is linked by a water mole each layer is linked by a water mole so you have one layer in which the hpo4 groups are linked by water molecules and the two layers are connected by, are interlinked by a, another set of water molecules so though the molecule is na2 the system is na2 hpo4 to h2o uh, there it says two water molecules but this crystallographically what people say is there are two water molecules but they are at a two non equivalent c1 sites they are they are at the general positions but they are non equivalent <clears throat> that is what a, a crystallographer will tell but a spectroscopy person will tell that Yeah, the, the two water molecules are two different environment the one water molecule is linking uh, making the layer another water molecule is interlinking the layers so both are at two different environments so if you look at the roman data so you'll have uh, stretching frequencies two stretching frequencies two antisymmetric stretching frequencies so uh, instead of uh, one antisymmetric one symmetric stretching frequency you have two symmetric components two antisymmetric frequencies that means there are two different water molecules but their environments are different and uh, this is the sps photo notation uh, this is what we use to make a oriented crystal measurements that is um, you cut the, this sps photo notation oriented crystal measurements but the cutting of the crystal is an a very important issue is an important issue uh, because you have to cut the crystal in, a, in the form of a rectangular parallel pipette with its edges parallel to the crystallographic directions 
to you have to cut the crystal in the form of a rectangular parallel pipette with its edges parallel to the crystallographic directions so now um, um, for only three systems orthorhombic tetragonal and cubic only the alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90 so in these three cases only you can make a rectangular parallel pipette with its edges parallel to the crystallographic directions whereas the other of course triclinic you cannot do it monoclinic <coughs> and trigonal and other systems uh, one just looks at the um, optical indicatrix they just to take the indicatrix axis and uh, cut the crystal along the indicatrix axis of course matrices have been developed um, so here uh, the, I, sh I have shown you a bracket uh, here the first letter x says that direction of the incident beam and the y here tells them direction of collection of the scattered beam that is your y and the first the, within the brackets you have z uh, that z tells the state of polarization of the incident beam z the second z it tells that the polarized component uh, polarized component received by the monochromate the polarized component received, that means you put an analyzer the analyzer allows the component which is parallel to the z direction uh, so that is z z then in this case the polarized direction incident beam has a polarized direction along the z direction whereas the analyzer allows only the polarized component along the x direction so you have uh, x y x y but you have a parallel arrangement that is that the state of polarization of the incident and the scattered beam are parallel whereas in the perpendicular the direction of scattered beam the polarized component of the scattered beam is perpendicular to the state of polarization of the incident beam so here this uh, within brackets the z z z x they all refer to the roman tensor components so you can just vary in the crystal and various positions you can derive the roman uh, tensor components and take the spectral measurements accordingly so the what is the what is the importance of this oriented crystal measurements because you know that crystalline is an anisotropic system so the roman line which may be intense in one direction may not be intense in the other direction so people have worked on that what should be the uh, intensity components corresponding so uh, and also theoretically you can predict in which orientation this uh, how many lines will come in which frequencies uh, in other orientation how many lines will come like that so you can group theoretically predicted the number of components in each orientation which are the allowed components so suppose the allowed component is forbidden or the forbidden component is appearing in the orientation that means the crystal has been deformed or there is an inhomogeneity or a damaged surface created mostly this problems will be looked into it when you have a, a film surface so crystallinity uh this is micro roman measurements so micro roman measurements why people just go for micro roman measurements that is you want to look at the crystallinity in the sub micron level and also they want to measure the lattice strain measurement and any contamination which happens at the surface that also people look into it. so this is an optical image of sno2 nanopowder and he have a that is as grown sample and b is annealed at 600 and c annealed at 800 d annealed at 1000 degree so you have the same material but you have a temperature treatment so you have annealed at various temperatures so you can see that the surface whereas there are clusters then it starts to decrease then you have a smooth surface that means the thermal treatment makes them uh, homogeneity of the crystals so this is an optical image now you take the roman spectrum so when you take the roman spectrum you have uh, this is the room temperature then annealed at various temperatures so you can see that this line intensity starts to grow and it becomes more narrow and uh, um, so you may ask a question because uh, this does not tells uh, whether the material has transferred from one phase to another phase so uh, here you have seen all the lines at the same frequencies or same roman shifts were observed for all the temperatures that means there is no change in the 
um, there is no change in the phase. It still remains that the tail structure. So the temperature, the thermal treatment has not <clears throat> made any phase change. Okay. Now what has made it has improved the crystallinity. It has improved the crystallinity, not making any transfer from root tail to anatase. So uh, just to a thermal treatment surface, if you look at the micro Raman measurements, we can just see and understand whether uh, what is the effect of the thermal treatment, whether the home uh, crystallinity is improved or not, or any damage is created on the surface, and so on. So here also, you have silicon, and silicon quartz, and uh, 650 degree. So depository power is 15 watt, another is at a 30 watt, Another is a 50 watt. So, uh, pure silicon uh, has a um, Raman line at 521 wave number. Pure silicon has a Raman line at 521 wave number. But the deposited one, you can see a 494, 499, 504. And uh, the first two, one, 494 is more prominent and 419 is less intense and 504. That means, uh, <clears throat> Uh, 494 is a more or less an amorphous and there is a disorder is more. Uh, but when you increase the power deposition rate, 30 watt, 60 watt, the amorphous nature gets decreased. But uh, still, uh, actually it moves from amorphous to crystalline state, but it has not come to the pure silicon. Uh, so here the intensity has come down. Why the intensity has come down is that because of the, the deposition power, so you may get amorphous, but when uh, higher power, the number of crystallites formed is very less. So this is uh, one case in which a yeah, substrate and uh, on which you have the ash color, because the substrate is semi-insulating gallium arsenide, and the substrate you have gain-rich gallium arsenide or p-rich gallium arsenide. And uh, this uh, round surface all shows the metal electrode. So you have a substrate on which N rich gallium arsenide or P rich gallium arsenide, and you have metal electrode. So this is a people used for a device. So <clears throat> again, I told you, as I told you, SPS photos notation oriented question measurements. So uh, gallium arsenide Raman spectrum, there is a, a two phonons. That is longitudinal optical phonons and transverse optical phonons. One is at 292 wave number, another is at 269 wave number. So the 292 elbow mode is allowed in the back scattering, and the transverse optic mode is forbidden. So uh, in the, when you make the orientation measurements, you can say which are the forbidden modes in a particular orientation, which are the allowed modes in the particular orientation. So in this backscattering geometry, in the backscattering geometry, we have seen that only one mode is allowed, another is forbidden. The forbidden is 268. So when you take the, when people, in fact, we, I did the measurements, when I, I did the measurements, uh, the forbidden mode is more intense than the allowed mode. That is 268 is, uh, 268 is more intense than the um, 292. The forbidden is more intense than the allowed. So this is an annealing. So we did the annealing. So when even we did annealing, still uh, uh, the signature remains the same. Maybe the intensity ratio got reduced. Then uh, we took for the P-rich gallium arsenide. So in the P-rich gallium arsenide also we have seen, but there, there also the forbidden is more intense than the allowed. Then uh, we annealed it. When we annealed it, we, we have seen that uh, forbidden intensity is less than the allowed intensity is more. So here the temperature effect has made uh, this disorderly one to be the more orderly one. So uh, that means the material, uh, uh, during the material preparation, uh, you have domains or you have regions which are highly disordered. So for the um, sake of understanding, uh, we took on the, I took on the substrate also, I took it. The substrate, of course, we have the allowed mode is more intense and the forbidden is very, very, as a, because the many, this, 
ratio is okay because when you do a perfect uh, backscattering experiment, it may not be possible. So there will be a, a small angle difference about five degrees because of the optics you use. So there will be a leak component. Uh, so uh, that way we can uh, allow it. So the absorbed features, uh, there is a modified first order fix. That means the material is partially modified. So the Raman signal originates from a set of confined but ordered regions embedded in an otherwise disordered medium. So you have a disordered medium and you have a small, small domains when you have an ordered one. So the two Raman lines observed in all samples, the wave vector non conservation, like that. So the second order modes also we observe. These are all the second order modes which you have at around 550, um, like this. So the second order modes, appearance of the second order modes is also indicative of induced lattice damage. Uh, Indensity of these modes are very weak. And you have this annealed one, as you can see that uh, it's almost. So, um, uh, so deep, the uh, introduction of the deep level states which trap chaotic areas can be the source of damages because they prepare in a plasma stage. So, so when you may make a uh, when you clean the surface with a plasma, so maybe the argon plasma may be in it, but it can destroy the surface. So when it destroys the surface, so you have may have disordered regions uh, which are in the local. Uh, no, we have an ordered regions which may be distributed on the disordered region or vice versa. So, but predominant, predominantly the disordered structure is. So one can make the uh, ITO by L ILO. Then uh, this is a you depth depth analysis that is when the beam penetrates through the sample. So you can go up to uh, nanometers because this is not the what we have in the experimental one. Then we have simulated and got it. It goes through at uh, nanometers. So P plus gallium arsenide annealed, the ratio is less, whereas the N plus annealed, so the, the value is very high. So that means you go from the forbidden to allowed, the ratio is very high. That is, the allowed mode uh, intensity is very low. So um, now you can they say uh, you take a material and anneal it is very temperature. This is what I include you. Same insulating and it's annealed at 673. Uh, here again, you see that um, forbidden is um, more than the allowed. Then you annealate 673. Uh, when you allow 673, you can see the two intensities are almost equal. That is a um, forbidden slice has to come down, come to the allowed one. And uh, then uh, you can calculate the area under the curve. So when you increase the, so anil the, and silicon implanted semi-insulating gallium arsenide. So you implant at various doses. Uh, that is uh, the influences are 1 into 10 to 11 per square centimeter, 1 into 10 to 12. So you um, target the sub surfaces with the silicon. So the silicon gets implanted on gallium arsenide. So during the implantation, it can damage the surface. So that is what we studied here. Uh, so when you increase, when you do that thermal treatment, ordering and the alignment of misordered crystallites takes place. So that is what you can see that the intensity starts to grow and also the area under the curve also increases. So here also 673, if you look at the 590. Maximum, because it strikes at the surface, what you have is a maximum damage at the surface. You can do a depth profile analysis also. So vibrations of a crystalline lattice at an interesting frequency. Um, it can be influenced uh, when the material is subject to a tensile or a compressive residual stress. So the residual stress um, can cause a wave, wave number shift in the characteristics peak. So uh, this peak uh, can be taken as a measure to probe, understand the stress. That is, um, you have um, two materials, one is grown and the other material. Um, um, if the lattice mismatch happens, there can be a stress developed under the interface. So this stress can lead to a 
tensile nature or the compressive nature to the system uh, that in fact affect the vibrational motion of the crystalline lattice or you can say that the vibrational or the Raman line of corresponding to the particular material can be influenced. The wave number shift can be expected uh, because of the stress generated in the wafer. So that shift, that amount of shift can be taken as a probe to understand the stress, compressive or the tensile stress. So just uh, you can, that kind of the relationship between the Raman shift and the biaxial stress is given by like So you can evaluate. So you can calculate uh, if the shift is four to wave number, wave number, the giga the stress and the carrier concentration. And also you can evaluate and the plus one frequencies also you can evaluate. So biaxial stress uh, decreases the increase in the annealing temperatures. That means uh, that indicates um, a lattice damage induced by the implantation here. Uh, the stress is generated. It is not because of the one layer lattice mismatch. The stress is generated by the implantation of the silicon atoms on the surface. Uh, so when uh, you have a, a stress generated because of the implantation, and when you make a temperature annealing, what happens is that the disordered structures slowly decreased, and you have an ordered structure. That is what it says. It indicates recovery of lattice damage induced by the implantation. So yellow phonons can interact with the free charged carriers. So uh, that is uh, because you have a <clears throat> end rich or P rich. So it can interact with the free charged carriers. So the shape of the longitudinal optical phonon line can be determined by the phonon plus one interactions only. So it can be a direct measurement of the carrier concentration. So uh, you probe uh, the line width of the L, uh, A1 elbow Raman line and try to understand the, the uh, actually uh, the phonon, phonon plus one interaction. But if the phonon plus one interaction is very strong, so you, you can go for a low PC mode, longitudinal optical phonon coupled mode. Because that time we could not record the low PC mode, but uh, later we found that. So th this was done uh, maybe in 2007. Um, seven. So later we could do the LOPC mode. So uh, longitudinal optical phonon coupled mode that gives a more direct measurement of the phonon plus one interactions from the LOPC mode wave number to width. We can just calculate the carrier concentration. So the peak shift attributed to the phonon confinement, the degree of disorder estimated in terms of the phonon correlation length. That is a spatial correlation model to analyze the Raman shape, line shape. So uh, you can say that uh, uh, <clears throat> you can say that uh, uh, here is a correlation length. Sorry. Um, can you see? No, sir. No? Okay. Okay. So this uh, correlation length that is uh, we have a. Uh, uh, small domains they are aware in which we have perfectly correlated. And um, so when you increase the temperature, you can see that the correlation length decreases. That means you have a very good um, dimensional, uh, that is, uh, you have a well correlated. Excuse me, sir. Please. We couldn't see the slide, sir. No? No, sir, not it, sir. No. Hello. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so the decrease in correlation length uh, that means uh, the phonon propagation gets terminated. So you have a small uh, clusters, very nice uh, crystallites. Whereas compared to that, the correlation length is very long. That is, uh, that means uh, the domain is not good. It's you have a, a very long uh, disordered one. So here you have a schematic view of indium gallium nitrate um, on gallium nitrate. 
and that is grown on n entire silicon substrate. So you have a substrate. So you have a galaminoitride and the ingan, then galaminated cap. So you have an aluminum nitrate dot which separates between the two. So you have, a, you can see the nanocolumns. Okay. So here's the galaminoid, right? So you take the Raman line corresponding to that. Uh, that is about 570 wave number. Uh, so you have a Laurentian fit for that. So sample. Sample one, sample two, sample three. So here you could see that the sample two, the profile is good, whereas in the other cases, the profile is not good. So the, it reflects the crystallinity uh, of the material. Suppose, the, of course, here it's a full width at half maximum is 2.9 to 3.5 wave number. So it's a fairly good one. But among the three samples, the sample two, it, so optic phonons, uh, that is optic phonons propagates in the lattice of a single crystal as a wave. So it exhibits dispersion depending upon their wavelength or equally the wave vector in the glowing zone. The momentum conservation selection group determines the region of the glowing zone axis. Infrared and Raman techniques allows the optical phonon close to the zone center. So you have Q is equal to zero selection rules, essentially the consequence of the infinite periodicity of the crystalline uh, disk. So at a Q is equal to zero fundamental, that is zone center fundamentals, the optical phonons uh, that can be evaluated through the infrared and Roman technique. So if, if you look at molecules, you have 3n minus 6 or 3n minus 5. When you go to the crystals, it is not that uh, uh, 3n minus, uh, it is a uh, number of optic modes or the optic branches. So you have 3n minus 3, that is 3 corresponding to the acoustic modes and 3n minus 3 corresponding to the optical phonons, uh, three acoustic phonons and 3 3n minus 3 optical phonons. So at the zone center uh, optic phonons, they can be understood from the infrared dominant techniques. So now, if the periodicity of the crystal is, in, say, infinite periodicity, infinite period, the periodicity crystal is interpreted, that means the rule is relaxed, the phonon propagation gets interpreted uh, when a grain boundary is encountered. So uh, you may have uh, uh, infinite periodicity of the lattice is, is just being disturbed. So particle size of B, phonon wave function must decay to a very small value close to the boundary. Then there is a restriction on the spatial extent of the wave function leads to the discrete values of the wave vector Q. So it allows phonons corresponding to those selected wave vectors to be sampled by Raman scattering study. So for a particle of size B, phonon wave function must decay to a very value close to that so we take a phonon correlation model. So that is change in the Raman peak position and line width with respect to the bulk. So we understand that uh, phonon confinement model. So you make a modeling on the Raman line shape. So it tells you they provide the behavior of the phonons in a nanometric sized systems that I put in a particle of size D. So you have a, a grain size confined in space by crystallite boundaries or surface disorders. Mm -hmm. Small divines when it's confined in space by crystalline boundaries are the surface. So this uh, phonon correlation model is so really not very really So you can uh, you have an experimental Raman line, and you can theoretically fit the Raman line. So what one has to theoretically fit is what for this um, diameter of the nano column, what should be the expected uh, Raman line profile for five. 70 wave number. So, so we just to make uh, various values of L1 and theoretically you simulate the 570 Raman line. For one setting, for one data, you match with the experimental, matches with the experimental data. That is taken as the uh, calculated value or that is the your uh, uh, column, actual diameter of the nano column. <clears throat> so from the theoretical uh, simulation, you match with the experimental one and try to understand what should be the diameter of the galaminoitrate nano column. So these are the various values uh, we just uh, simulate uh, the calculated Raman spectrum because I told you the density uh, correlation model there formally. So you calculate the Raman line or you simulate the Raman profile. So our own particular value of L1, it matches with the experimental level. So that you take it as that uh, width of the diameter of the 
So indium nitride core and gallium nitride shell, you have a silicon substrate. So here also you have a gallium nitride uh, that is five is indium nitride five is because indium nitride is a core, gallium nitride is a shell. Again, uh, you have the indium nitride core. You take the uh, simulate the Raman spectrum or the calculate uh, Raman spectrum for the A1 helicophone and more. And it goes from the values of L1 to 100 nanometers to 3 nanometers. So it was published because Jagannathan has worked on this when he was doing a, his postdoc research in Germany. So he has provided the materials for us. And uh, my student P. Sangeeta exclusively worked on that. And uh, his uh, TIM data exactly matched with our calculated data. Sample 1, sample 2. So you can calculate the free carrier concentration, uh, okay, free electron oscillations coupled to the longitudinal mode, producing coupled phonon plus one oscillations, PLP, or the other is a low PC mode like that. So you can uh, experimentally simulate uh, the value of N, because if you know the plus one frequency, then you can go for N value. And uh, you have experimental data A1, LO mode, and you simulated the uh, spectrum corresponding to the uh, various carrier concentration values. So in particular concentration values, it matches, then you take it as the, that is the carrier concentration. So these values are verified by the all effect measurements exactly matches well. So uh, the Raman uh, measurements help you to understand the grain size, and also you can evaluate the carrier concentration. People have worked on uh, carrier density mapping of the material with the wrong. We have not worked on it because uh, you can evaluate uh, because what you have is the N is 5.8 into 16 per cm cube. It is the data at a particular point in the surface, particular point on the surface. But people have taken uh, 400 Raman data over a region of uh, 3 by 3 microns and taken on each small, that's 400 points. So each point, what should be the carrier concentration? Then they have evaluated, they simulated the carrier concentration mapping on the surface. So that is not possible by your other methods like Hall effect and so on. So Raman mapping is nothing but uh, you map uh, a surface uh, because when you go to a studio, a, a photo is taken. And the light, they shine you on a light, and your intensity distribution is measured uh, on a film. Of course, now your digital cameras are there. So, the conventional camera, the intensity falls on the photographic plate, is recorded. What do you have? Intensity distribution. Like that, one can uh, think for the Raman mapping, uh, the Raman intensity mapping of uh, in a two dimensional plane that is the x-ray direction. So, you move the sample to different points of the excitation. The point, laser point strikes, la the direction of the incident remains the same. Only thing is that you move the sample across it and collect separate Raman spectrum at each point. So here is the gallium nitrate, gallium nitrate, coarser nanowires. It is on, uh, I told you this uh, <clears throat> silicon. Um, so you have the, take, we have taken a small region in which this uh, green region is the, uh, Indium nitrate, gallium nitrate, partial nanowire, whereas the block dots are nothing but the voids or you see the substrates. So you take the Raman spectrum. So in this region, you have the gallium nitrate or the indium nitrate from industry, common lines. Of course, you have A1 Raman line that is the pi centigrade. And the void region is the one you have the silicon. So this is a, you put a color code uh, for a particular Raman line and uh, you have. Uh, you can just do it. so. This is nothing but in a Raman replica of an optical surface. <clears throat> so, uh, like that, you can just do an intensity mapping. Only thing is, uh, you take a Raman line and you measure the intensity across the surface. Um, maybe 200 or 300, 400 Raman lines you can measure. So, depending upon the number of uh, data points you collect in a region, that gives you a very good resolution of the Raman intensity mapping. 
graphene, then just to go to graphene, you have a D mode, G mode, 2D mode, and uh, D mode, D band is a general characteristic of the damages of the graphene sheets create edges defects. Width of the G band remains unchanged. D band intensity increased. So that is, you have a various um, growth parameters. So you can um, see how the G band and D band intensity variations. Then you evaluate ID by IG to characterize the level of disorder in the graphene sheets, the intensity ratio. But what one can do is that uh, D, you can measure the D intensity mapping, that is D band mapping, and uh, that is 1330 wave number. So I just measure the small, oh, sorry. There are small voids on the surface. Uh, actually, it exactly resembles to your. Uh, actually, what mm -hmm. one can try to understand is that yeah, this uh, you have the color. This uh, uh, it starts with the light red and increases, and uh, so that means uh, you should not understand that you don't have a graphene here, uh, but the layer thickness, uh, the density is very small. So wherever you have a um, good sample and you have a D band intensity is high. So that means this uh, tells you the inhomogeneity uh, on the prepared graphene sheets because of the chemical exploration technique. So you can just measure the ID band, IG bands mm -hmm. diagram. So the same, this thing you can go for Raman in G and 2D bands. And uh, so here the uh, green line <coughs> is the G band and 2D band uh, is the blue line. So you just to measure. So what ultimately, see, uh, at a given time, you can measure five or six uh, Raman line intensity. But the only thing is you may have to make a, should know the wave number and you put a color code uh, and uh, take a data. So simultaneously it occurs and generates your intensity mapping. But all are distinct, uh, all are distinct data. You get. Well, may not, you will not get one mix with the other. I will tell you. So zinc oxide decorated graphene nanocomposite. So you have a, a zinc oxide concentration is very low. So if you take the Raman spectrum on the surface, you say small, small clusters. So I we did the this not optical image, it's a Raman image. So you can say small clusters of Z and O. Now you increase the Z and O concentration. Now you see the surfaces, maybe clusters are there. In a particular, this thing, you have a bright domains, that means the, the dark domains are graphite, uh, graphene, and uh, you can see it's uniformly distributed on the surface. So, of course, you can just look at it from your same data or your optical image, but only thing is what you can try to understand here is that when the void is there, that region you can focus and try to understand the interaction between the material on the damages created by the, any of the consequences. Titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, and graphene. Okay, so you can, uh, here you see 400 data points. So yellow colored area, titania and zinc oxide, nanoparticles, green and red colors, G and D bands of graphene. So yellow colored refers to the titania and zinc oxide and the green and red colors, G and D. So you can see that uh, the uh, green and uh, red color. <clears throat> So here you see the G band uh, is like that. The defect band is more dominant here. They are dominant here, whereas the G band industry is predominant here. So it does not mean that um, uh, here there is no graphene. There is no graphene here. So graphene is there, but the uh, layered structure is like that. The uh, defect band is more here, like that. There, is, there also you can. Uh, do it so with the blue coloring indicating graphene and nanoparticles. So there's two dimensional mapping. So here, four hydrogen silicon power by it's a precise structure. So you have a band at um, 797 and 981, 982 wave number. So when it is irradiated with a transition metal nickel ion at various influences, you can say one into two to the power by square centimeter, it is like this the surface. 10 to the power 12, it gets damaged, 10 to the power 13, it becomes almost blue. That means the nickel 
and hydrogen that formed a, a, it formed an interaction. A new frequency arises suppressing the silicon carbide. This what is that? You are uh, T line or 797 or 982, right? So then the surface damage is high. So the surface you have a new uh, type of um, material that is because of the implantation. See if you have a uh, aluminium and um, if you prepare the native, they can you can always expect a native oxide formation over the time and it is exposed to the atmosphere. So the native oxide formation can be determined. Uh, over the period with the Raman measurements, how the native oxide is formed. In fact, what we did in the uh, Ministry of Electrocommunication is that uh, gallium arsenide and uh, indium um, gas is allowed to diffuse. And we have seen that um, um, indium oxide, that is, uh, small, small clusters are formed there, now and there, here and there, uh, damaging the whole uh, gallium arsenide uh, surface. That you can uh, optically you can see it, but uh, Raman measurements, intensity mapping, you can just to do it. But people have done Raman frequency mapping. That is, a, a, at each, if you take 400 nano point, data points, you take one Raman line at 578 or your 982 wave number. Then you take the 982 wave number. If you take a four and each uh, data points, uh, it may be the same or it may not be the same. So what you have data is a frequency uh, spread. So you can make a frequency mapping. These are all the intensity mapping associated with the 797 or 982. But just to take one Raman line, how the frequency has changed across the surface. That is very interesting because if we have a if we have a column like this and uh, uh, you measure. And you can see that if you take a data point when the columns and the edges, you can see the, how the frequency changes. Here, the intensity mapping will be different, but the frequency mapping will say, as I told you, that um, uh, the characteristic shift will, uh, wave number shift will happen in the characteristic depending upon the residual or the compressive or the tensile stress. So you can see that how the stress developed as reflected in the characteristic peak, but you just measure the intensity uh, the frequency distribution. People have evaluated uh, the frequency distribution and also the uh, stress distribution on the sun. So these are the students which have associated with me or Lashmi, Sangeeta, Gayatri and Jaipal. What I'm trying to tell you is uh, Raman effect. Uh, uh, it appears to be very simple. Uh, when a beam of monochromatic falls, you have elastically, inelastically scattered photons, uh, strokes, and anti strokes lines. And uh, when uh, it was uh, done, and when people ex uh, extrapolated it for the various activities, various regions, uh, various domains of the science, people never thought that it was going to be a very strong analytical tool in the material characterization. So, with the development of laser, it has gone to a very high. Then uh, with the development of uh, micro Roman instruments, it has gone beyond the expectations. So uh, when, you, when now you have a you know, structured or a disordered material, you can just do a surface studies through a micro Roman measurements. Uh, the financial assistance received from DST, CSAR, and EGC is also gratefully acknowledged. And so again, I thank Rishman sir for giving me an opportunity uh, to we are talking here tomorrow is there, there. and uh, thank you very much thank you sir the session is open for discussion participants are requested to post your questions in the chat box Sir, how are you, sir? Hello, sir. Sir, how are you, sir? Sir, how are you, sir? Sir, how are you, sir? Okay, okay, okay.
yesterday I could not come for the inauguration and uh, uh, I just rushed but uh, I came inside when you are when you started to give the talk okay Sir, sir, there is a question in the chat box, sir. So, what is the origin of the B and G bands in Raman spectrum of graphene and graphene oxides? Why Raman spectrum is crucial in deciding the quality of the prepared graphene? Okay, fine. So, okay, now you see that uh, uh, in graphene, there are uh, three Raman lines. One is a D Raman line that it requires the defect for its activation. And it is a band, it's a vibrational motion associated with the disorder in the system. G band, it is a E to G phonon at the below end zone center. 2D band, it's a second order zone boundary phonons. It appears as a very strong single peak in the monolayer graphene. So graphene and graphene oxide are different. So, <clears throat> so this D, G, 2D bands, and their frequencies or the characteristics of the graphene. Okay, so when it goes to the graphene oxide, when I say its structure is modified, so the activity of the lines will also be modified or the intensity will also be modified. As I so told you, this um, 2D band, it appears as a very strong single peak in a monolayer graphene, but it splits into multiple components. So if we, the band splits into multiple components, that means you have prepared a, a many layer graphics. So, so a data which is essential to classify graphene or graphene oxide, you can take any spectroscopic tool. There is no difference, no, no problem at all. You can go to SEM, you can go to XRD, uh, like that. But Raman is also another spectroscopic technique which gives you the, the quality to decide the quality of the prepared graphene and graphene oxide. As I told you, if you make a Raman mapping, intensity mapping, you can understand what is the quality of your prepared graphene. So you may look at from the optical image, that is the prepared material is a homogeneity or inhomogeneous, but that may not give many physical significance. Whereas I told you, you know, uh, you, you can have intensity distribution even for uh, non-uniformly for the G band and D band. So you can see that the defect bands are the, the discontinuity of the graphenes are found where the defect is more. So that is the region where you get D band. So, Raman spectral data will give a very nice, it can be used as a fingerprint for this. But unfortunately, what I could see from the materials characterization, this thing is maybe just a, a lucid two to three sentences. It is not a lucid two to three sentences. You have to just look into it and understand the phenomenon. Okay, so that's why Raman data is very essential for understanding the quality of the prepared graphene and graphene oxides. You can prepare by any methods, but there will be always, a, the growth parameters can play a role on the quality. So Raman spectroscopy technique is a one good technique which we, we can understand the surfaces, okay?
Thank you, sir. Okay. I request the participants to kindly fill the feedback form. The tomorrow session will start at 9.30 a.m. Participants are kindly requested to join at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, you are in the college. Yes, sir. I am in the college. Sir, welcome. Sir, welcome. Sir, welcome. Sir, welcome. Sir, welcome. There are many inspirations. Yes, sir. Uh, the morning, I had a small problem. That is why I could not come at 10 o'clock. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Huh? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir.